from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, as we go into your word, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds, give us faith to receive your word, to know that it is you speaking, that it is the truth, and that you, Father, are where we will find our hope and true life. We ask that you would lead us to it. We ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. A few weeks ago, I was walking through Tyson's Mall, and it seemed like the current trend in marketing was to tell people that they are beautiful just the way they are. You don't need to lose weight, you don't need to change, you are beautiful just the way they are, and that their products would help them to be true to themselves, to express their beauty. And this, this statement, you are beautiful just the way you are, it's a, it's a statement that I really, really like to hear from people. You know, a f uh, few years ago, I had a lot of like uh, confidence issues because of my appearance and things like that. Like I gained so much weight in college. And whenever someone would tell me, no, you're beautiful just the way you are, I would love that person for telling me that. It's such an encouraging and pretty thing to say to someone. It feels really good when you're hearing this, especially when you're feeling down, when you're going through something difficult in life, when you feel ugly, or like a failure. But at the same time, as uplifting and encouraging as this may sound, this message is not the same message that we hear from God. The statement, you are beautiful just the way you are, is not something you will ever find anywhere in the Bible. And God never ever says something like this to any of us. What does God say? to us just the way we are. He says something that is both incredibly insulting to our modern ears, and at the same time, so encouraging and uplifting that it makes that phrase, you're beautiful just the way you are, it makes it seem cringe-worthy and empty in comparison. The message that God gives us is the gospel. And this passage that we read today, Ephesians chapter 2, is pure gospel. It is one of the clearest, most precise, most descriptive uh, explanations of God's gospel that we find anywhere in the Bible. If you want one of the most clear summaries of the gospel, it's found here in Ephesians chapter 2. And it's the first part of God's message, God's gospel, that is so insulting to us. Look at verse 1 with me. The world tells us, you're beautiful just the way you are. God says, you are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. He doesn't say you were sick. He doesn't say you were on the wrong path, that you were making a few mistakes, that you're just flawed, you're broken, like the rest of us. He says... 
You are so sinful, so evil, that you are dead. Why does Paul, the Apostle Paul use the word dead here instead of something like sick? Because, you know, when, you, when we hear the Christian message, a lot of people like to say, we're sick. We have this sickness because of our sin. But Paul doesn't say sick. He says, you're dead. Why would he choose that word? Why is that word so important? Well, what's the difference between a sick person and a dead person? A sick person, once she finds out from the doctor that she is indeed ill, that she has a disease, she can start helping herself. She can start doing things like take medicine, work out, eat healthy, etc. She can do something about it. A dead person cannot help herself. A dead person, there is nothing they can do, period. And so what is Paul saying here by first telling us that we were dead in our sins? He's saying that apart from the hope that God gives us in the following verses, you are utterly hopeless. Just like a dead person has no hope to become better. To, to take medicine, to eat good food, to work out and heal themselves and make themselves better again. You and I, apart from what God gives us, we are utterly helpless to do anything to help ourselves from the spiritual state that we are in. We are dead and there is not much a dead person can do after they have been deceased. And it's really, really hard to see ourselves this way. It's really hard to think about ourselves as dead people, so evil, so corrupt, so wicked that we are already dead, and there is nothing we can do. We have our own ideas and pictures of what spiritual deadness looks like, and it doesn't look anything like me, in my mind. In my mind, spiritual deadness comes in the form of curse words spewing out of the mouth of an angry delinquent or someone who is beating his wife, a student who's constantly cheating on his homework, a person who is constantly lying every time they open their mouths, using their money to buy drugs in the school bathroom. That's what, in my mind, spiritual deadness looks like. And all the while, we avoid these kinds of people, the people out on the streets, the immoral groups, we avoid them as if their sins and their spiritual deadness are contagious. And if we associate ourselves with them, we too will catch their sinfulness. We thank God whenever we see people like that. And we pray to God saying, Thank you for not making me like one of those people. And before we know it, we're praying just like that Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 from the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector who says, I thank you, God, that I am not like this tax collector. And we forget that it is that person that Jesus said is not found righteous before God. Anytime you look down on a person, any person, for whatever reason, when you are looking down, the moment you are looking down, C.S. Lewis says, in order to look down on a person, you must think inside your mind that you are above them. And that is the sin beneath all sins, the sin of pride, of self-centeredness. That sin is so lethal, so poisonous, that one drop of it will kill you. And it is the one sin that every human being has tasted. We look to people out on the streets doing immoral things, and we see that their lives are so filled with evil and immoral acts. Whereas myself, I try to do good things. My good works far outnumber their good works, and so I must be better than them. They must be the spiritual dead. But. Is it possible to have a drop of poison and survive? Someone who drinks 
an entire, an entire glass of poison versus someone who takes one droplet of poison, the result is the same. There is something deeply wrong with us. That is the message that God begins with. He does not say to you, you are beautiful just the way you are. He says you are dead if you remain just the way you are. You are sinful just the way you are. You are evil just the way you are. And unless you recognize the need for salvation, the need for help, you will never be asked to be saved. This is the first part of the Christian gospel. If you ever hear a sermon that does not in some way offend you, insult you by talking about your sin, it may be the greatest sermon you've ever heard. It may be the greatest motivational speech you've ever heard. But it is not a Christian sermon that you are hearing. It is not from God. Because God, why would he come to save? Why would, think of all the words we use to describe the God of the Bible. The helper, the savior, the redeemer, the rescuer, the strong tower, the defense. What are all of these descriptives talking about? It is talking about an act of helping someone in need. And if you do not think that you are in need, you do not need God. The Christian gospel does not apply to anyone who, do, who does not think that they are in need of salvation. Now the word gospel, as you all know, means good news. And if you end here, if you end the message here, it's not good news that you're dead just the way you are. But the good part of God's gospel begins in verse 4. Look at verse 4 with me. Look at these two words that Paul begins with in verse 4 that overwhelm the heart of the desperate sinner with a tidal wave of relief and comfort. You know those before and after pictures and uh, those commercials that a lot of people use? Before, you were like this, but use our product, and then this is what will happen to you afterward. That's kind of what Paul is doing here. In verse 1 to 3, he gives us the before picture. But what is the product or the thing that Paul is trying to advertise here? He gives us what he's giving us in verse 4, the first two words. He says, but God. But God. You were dead in your sins. You followed the course of the world. You were led by the false encouragement of the devil, telling you that you don't need any help. You are fine just the way you are. You were a child of wrath, Paul says. And then he tells us, but God. Can we take a moment to dive into the immense power of those two words that Paul is giving to us right there? It doesn't seem like much, those two words. But think of it like this, every time you're watching a movie and you see the utterly helpless and impossible state of a certain character in danger, this character is in danger. Like, there's a ton of action movies who, that always depict this. this. This guy is like, he, he somehow ended up beneath the, all the rubble of this collapsed building and the skyscraper's falling on him and he's utterly helpless, but then, the hero appears just at the right moment. And right when the hero appears, the music is so appropriate for that, it's epic, and you're feeling like awe and relief, and there's goosebumps all over your body. What, what movie makers are doing in those scenes, I believe, is they are taking, they're stealing from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. All of those scenes are an echo of what Paul is giving to us in Ephesians 2, verse 4. You are dead. But in verse 5, but God has made you alive with Christ. You were lost in the world, verse 6, but God has raised you up with Christ. You are a child of wrath, verse 6, but God has seated you in the heavenly places with Christ. How did all of this occur? Why would God do this? Paul repeats three times throughout this passage in verses 5, 7, and 8 how he did this. And he says, by grace you have been saved. What does grace mean? 
Is this a term that you are able to define biblically? Perhaps a term that is more relatable and close to us is a word that Paul uses at the end of verse 8. He uses a word to describe what grace means here. He uses the word gift. He says, by grace you have been saved. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. One way to understand grace is to understand gifts. A gift is not something that a person earns or works for. You don't earn a gift. You don't earn or work for a gift. A gift is given freely by the giver as an expression of what they feel toward another person. Now, I'm sure all of you would be grateful if I were to show up one Sunday with a, with a bag and give it to you and tell you, this is an expression of how I feel for you, feel about you. And you open that bag and there's one of those new iPad Pros in there. Oh, Pastor Josh, I know he doesn't even have any money. This is how he feels about me? iPad Pros are great, but maybe you have one already. Or maybe you don't like Apple. Or maybe you really, really like it. Whatever the case may be, it would make a great gift, but it is not the best gift. What are the best kinds of gifts? What are the best kinds of gifts? They are the ones that you absolutely cannot live without. You need this in your life in order to live. They are the ones that are so costly to the giver that when you receive such a gift, you're kind of traumatized by how much this person is sacrificing in order to express their love for you. Let's say you end up lost in some place in South America, and you contract a disease there. And you're going to die if you don't receive immediate treatment. You learn that this treatment is way beyond your current financial reach. And there's no way of taking a loan out here because you're in a foreign place. But then you find out that someone living here, someone incredibly wealthy, learned about your situation. And he goes and liquidates all of his assets. He, he sells off most of what he has and uses that incredible sum of money to pay for your treatment. In that situation, you did not do anything to earn that person's gesture. You did not deserve it in any sense. It was something you needed. When you are dying of a disease, you need treatment more than you need an iPad Pro. And it was also incredibly costly to this person. This person ended up in poverty once he paid for your medical treatment. Now, if something like that sounds crazy, you would never believe it. It goes against our sense of logic and reason. But this, that picture is what grace is. That is grace. It's the one gift that is so costly, but so needed in your life, that you depend on it to survive. It's so costly that you're traumatized by how radical the love of the giver is toward you. 1 Peter 1.12 says, even the angels marvel and wonder at the gospel at the grace that God gives to human beings. Do you understand what Peter's saying there? The angels are looking at what God is doing for sinners and they marvel, they wonder, why, how? That is the grace that God is giving us on the cross. That is the gospel. The gospel is a very different message from what you and I hear from the world. No, you are not beautiful just the way you are. If you are beautiful just the way you are, no one would have been crucified. You are so dead in your sins that God, the most beautiful person to have ever existed, had to have gone through the most grueling death. Not just physical death, but spiritual condemnation, hell itself, in order to redeem you. But why? 
The why question is where you will be more encouraged and more uplifted than any message that the world will offer you. The why question. Because God loves you. Because He is gracious to you. Because He is for you. Now, a lot of us might ask ourselves, you know, we, we tend to distance ourselves from this. It's hard for us to personalize Jesus' crucifixion. But have you ever heard of the word predestination? Election? Do you know what that means? A lot of people are offended by that doctrine, but Paul goes over it in Ephesians. Predestination and election is saying, this is what it's saying. It's not saying, oh, God sends some people to hell. It's saying, if you were the only person that was living on this earth, because God sees you as his elect, because he chose you before you were born, before you did anything, even if you were the only person here, Jesus would have come for you and he would have died on the cross for you because you are his. That is what election and predestination is saying. This is very, very personal to you. A lot of people, they spend a lot of time away from church where they do a lot of things they shouldn't be doing during their week and they find it really, really difficult to come out on Sundays. They find they're not worthy of coming out. They have a lot of guilt whenever they stand in church. They're misunderstanding the gospel. The gospel does not say Jesus loves you after you love him first. You do not receive Jesus into your heart to, to receive salvation. That is a common American misunderstanding of the gospel. If you have ever said to God, Jesus, I receive you into my heart. I don't know where you got that. You probably got it from a pastor like me. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you don't receive God. God chose you before you were born. You don't come to church because you're ready. You don't become a Christian because you're doing good things and finally you've paved the way for your life in order to make things better, in order to receive God and make Him part of your life. You go to God because you need help, because you are so helpless without Him. And God already did everything. Jesus already was crucified before you were even born, before you even knew what he had done for you while you were still living as enemies of the cross of Christ. He had already loved you. Do you know what that means? It means you should never feel guilty of coming in, in, in God's presence because it's not dependent on you. It's not what you're doing in your life that makes it, makes, makes you worthy of standing in front of his presence. It's what Christ did for you. Now ask yourself this question. Has what Jesus done for you on your behalf, is that enough for you to feel guiltless before God when you're standing before Him? Everything Jesus did throughout His entire life, He did as your representative, as your covenant head, as your substitute. When God looks at you, He does not see your death. He does not see you and your sins. He has forgotten all of that because why? Where, who are you when you stand before God? He sees Jesus. You know, I read about this woman who was an intern at Disney World. And she was an intern there and she would dress up as Mickey Mouse. And she would be going through so much difficult things in her life. But then she would show up at Disney World, dressed up as Mickey Mouse, and all the children would not see her, whatever her name was, whatever her identity was out in the world, they would see Mickey. And they would run to her and hug her and love her and tell her stories about how much they love her. And she, she said that was her healing time. The receiving so much love and attention from the children, that was what got her through the times of suffering in her life. That is you when you are in Christ. You are hidden in Jesus. Just like that woman was hidden in Mickey. When God looks at you, he sees his son, the righteous, 
perfection of His Son. And then you are made beautiful in Christ. You were dead just the way you are. You were not beautiful just the way you are. But God, being rich in grace, made you alive with Christ. And in Christ, you are made more than beautiful. You are made perfect in Him. Let's make that gospel the thing that we believe in, not just with our minds, but with our hearts. Believe that in your life. This is what one pastor, Tim Keller, says about the grace of God, about this gospel. If you know the grace of God, it's the end of suspicion. It's the end of accusation. It's the end of always making sure nobody is getting ahead of you. It's the end of always being anxious that you're not living up. It's the end of always comparing yourself to other people. It's the end of all that. Why? Because you are no longer your own person. You are united with Christ. Jesus makes you perfect before God. Let's pray.